Right, so we're into our final round. We're going to get cracking in a minute. I normally would introduce Paul, but I think literally everyone knows him. Um, but no, this is Paul Fenwick. He is uh, from the internet. Uh, what did he put on his own badge? He's a benevolent troublemaker this time round. Um, and he has recently been working on a physical game, not one of these, you know, video game things. It's an escape room. I'll let him take it from here. Thank you. Hi everyone. So Tim, can I ask you a favour? Yeah. Can you take a picture of everyone here so you can tell everyone how amazing this mini-conf is and how many people have attended? <laughs> awesome. Also send it to me. So hi everyone. <laughs> hi everyone, my name is Paul. Um, this entire talk is Creative Commons licensed. Um, I'll give you a link to the slides at the end. So if you miss anything, if there's any extra references, you can find the entire thing up on GitHub. Um, so this is me talking about a game that I've been working on called Room Service. Now, room service, the best description I have for it is it is a scary puzzle-solving reverse escape room game. And I will explain what each part of those means. So it's scary. It's, it's more kind of a creepy game, um, but it's scary in that there are cannibals that are going to eat you unless you stop them. And cannibals are scary. Um, it's a game where uh, the players have been hired as serving staff in this hotel. So the background of the game is people have been hired as serving staff for this conference in a hotel um, and they find themselves in the kitchen where they're expecting to be like serving things to the guests and they discover that actually it's the cannibals convention and as serving staff they're going to be served. And so this is the, the obvious twist which is on the booking form when you book. Um, so this is, this is not spoilers, um, but you then have to stop the cannibals from getting to you. Um, and that brings into the puzzle solving part of the game, in that the, the room is filled with puzzles and um, you have to solve the puzzles in order to be able to stop the cannibals reaching you. Um, and each puzzle will give you a code um, and that code then gets put into hardware and that hardware is running a simulation of the entire game. So you've got this virtual hotel which is out there and you can see these cannibals moving around and doing things and they, they have personalities and so on. Um, so that's an example of a puzzle. Um, and what the whole game sort of revolves around um, is this huge board which is on the, the wall. And um, this is still, all these processes were taken during build, all these pictures were taken during build. Um, it, the actual final room is much, much creepier than all of this. Um, this is Ricky, who's our hardware person. She is like the best person ever and pretty much saved me at least two litres of tears when it came to soldering and construction. Um, but this here is this big map that is on the board and when you solve a puzzle you can put things into the keypad and you can use that to lock down a room or lock down a corridor or in some cases lock down an entire floor and that would stop the cannibals from being able to move through the hotel and hopefully stop them from reaching you. And the game starts off, the cannibals aren't very hungry, they're off doing their own things. As the game goes on they get more and more hungry, they take more aggressive actions against you. Um, on that uh, display, there is a couple of uh, uh, consoles, a, a little 16 by 2 displays. Um, this here was, you can't see that very well, but you can see there it's showing a, a version number of the software which we're running, which I'll go through in a moment. Uh, it also asks you things like which doors, uh, there'll be other messages which get delivered here as well. So this is a way that the player can interact with the rest of the hotel. Um, so overall, and, and usually they don't have this debug cable hanging out the side, uh, that's a USB cable to my machine um, because I wanted to see what the display was doing without me standing behind this where there's like a game runner's uh, room which is behind. So overall I think it's pretty cool. Um, it also comes with costumed actors, um, so if you actually have a cannibal who manages to reach you, then it's very scary. Uh, there are special effects which happen, there are creepy voiceovers, and, and we've been told it's fun. So that's good. The, the players we've had through have, have told us it was fun. So what hardware was involved with this? So all the source code for this is available, which I'll come, uh, come to in a moment. So what hardware did we use with this? Um, well, a lot of off-the-shelf stuff. Uh, so we have a, a Teensy 3.2, which is an absolutely amazing little chip. I'm just incredibly blown away by them. Uh, a few 16 by 2 displays. Uh, they have ITC backpacks on the, on the back of them. Uh, we have a lot of lights. The map actually has uh, a light for every room and a light for every door. And to run them, we have, uh, they're called TLC uh, 4957s. Each of them can run a lot of LEDs, whatever that goes up to, 24 uh, LEDs per board and we have lots of these. And they're effectively little shift registers, you can push things to them, there are drivers uh, that you can download. These are uh, an Adafruit board, which is based around that chip, they're awesome. 
There's also a lot of wires, and I mean a freaking lot <laughs> of wires. Um, the back of the board looks less like a spider now, um, because we've changed some of the architecture and how things run. We have a, a number of buses uh, which get used, but even so, it ends up being a lot of wires on the back. Um, but it was really cool working on it. It was really cool when we got it testing. Uh, this is Robert, who is the uh, script and game designer. Um, and you can see here, we've actually got some of the lights coming on. We were testing which lights were working and, and which ones weren't. We also have a really cool map. Uh, the map by itself is actually like this cool piece of art. And um, I've done a lot of work on software projects which produce sort of intangible things. Um, you know, here is a program which does this. Here's a program which hooks into these APIs. It was incredibly satisfying working on a project where you had something that you could physically touch and something where I didn't, like obviously I wrote the program, I didn't do any of the map stuff here. So to be able to come in and go, oh my goodness, this is super cool, we've got something with lights and you know, um, uh, beautiful writing in this map and everything, and this polished wood is fantastic. Behind the scenes, um, there was about 2,300 lines of C++ code across 43 files. And um, I don't know here how many people, how many people have worked on an Arduino project before? Some of you? Okay. How many people have worked on a project that large? Yeah, not as many of you. And, and if you've been using the Arduino IDE, having 43 tabs open <laughs> isn't very fun. And so I'll explain how we got around that in a moment, because there are much better ways of doing it. But there's an awful lot of code in the, the back end. Um, and one of the reasons for that is it's designed to be an event-based um, platform which you can use for writing games in general. So if you wanted to write a game for an Arduino-compatible uh, microprocessor and you want to do things um, like what we've got here, uh, actors which do goal evaluation, what are they going to do next, this ever-increasing hunger which changes their behavior, uh, movement messages, your, the player's console can actually get hacked if people make it to the, uh, uh, the plant room in the hotel, they can shut down the console that the players have and it unlocks all the doors as well. <laughs> and so it's, it's very, very frightening. You thought that you were safe and you'd managed to lock down the hotel and then suddenly, boom, everything's down and you get this message which is like system override uh, from this location. Um, and of course, the doors unlock and everything else. Um, so this was designed to be a framework uh, that can support multiple games. And the way in which we've designed it um, is to have pluggable game files. So if you wanted to run uh, the same game but a different map, that just involves changing the file which has the map inside it. Um, if you wanted to have the same game but you wanted to have uh, additional cannibals, for example, to make it harder or easier, um, again, you'd just change those files. And in fact, you could have this where instead of it being like a, a game where the player's in the hotel, they might be in like a crashed spaceship or something and there are aliens trying to, to get through, and you have to like lock down these bulkheads to, to slow the aliens like coming into the, to the, sh into the ship. It's a Doctor Who episode generator. It's a Doctor Who episode <laughs> generator, yeah. Complete, complete with the scary costumes. I can't actually show you the costumes because they're spoilers, um, but the, the, I, they're better than the old Doctor Who costumes, but they're like about on par with Doctor Who costumes. <laughs> so all of the pluggable game files live inside a game data directory, mainly because I was playing a lot of Kerbal Space Program, and in Kerbal Space Program, there was a game data directory, and that's where you put your mods and changes and how the game works. So I did exactly the same thing. Um, if you're wondering what the game files in there look like, um, this is actually an example from uh, our game. Um, so we've got a, a map object which is built for you, um, and then you can say, I want to add a new room to that. And new rooms always have um, a, a name, they have an internal ID. If I was to ever do this again, it would return a generated ID because it's very, very easy to end up with two rooms with the same ID and then everything breaks. Um, but it has an ID, it has a floor number. The reason that's a string is because it's something that the players might enter into the console and anything which comes into the console is a string. Um, it has a, a code which they can enter to access uh, that particular room. Not everything has a code, so uh, corridors, for example, can't be directly addressed by the player. Um, and it has an LED uh, that's that uh, it maps to as well. So when we're updating that hardware, it turns that LED on or off. Um, we can also set doors. Um, a by door is a bi-directional door. It can go both ways. It swings both ways. Um, you can also have unidirectional doors. 
Uh, the idea is if you have something like a fire escape, the fire escape might let somebody enter the fire escape but not leave the fire escape. Um, what was that? Trapdoor. A trapdoor or a trapdoor, which they can fall down. The other thing is that we could have uh, actors and, <laughs> and one of my happiest moments of the project was discovering that Rob has not seen actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> and, so, and so everyone's like, today's your lucky day. And we just had this magnificent watching of this, this video, which if you haven't seen is worthwhile. Um, but the idea is that you can have these actors, they've got names, they have movement speeds, a starting room. Um, hunger break is when they start getting hungry. So after 15 hungry ticks, they start getting hungry. Um, some actors start off being hungry. Some of them don't get hungry to the end. And they have sort of regular goals and hungry goals. Um, also not shown here is you can say how long it is before they first activate. So all the cannibals, most of the cannibals start in their rooms. Um, and some of them won't actually wake up and start moving around until you know, a number of minutes into the game. Um, there is also a game runner console. So behind the map is this tiny little room uh, which has a sound desk, um, it has a lighting desk, and there is also a laptop there. Um, and the laptop is taking the serial output from the Teensy. And so everything which is happening in the game also gets reported to the game runner. And so you end up with output uh, which looks like this. And uh, you can see here that there's a message, Reynold is heading to the roof. Um, that's actually a message to run a pre-recorded sound effect, which then tells the players that, that this thing is happening. Um, the other thing is that we used to have it such that every movement would be reported. That was a lot of spam because there was lots and lots of actors in the game, lots of cannibals. Instead, every time they evaluate their goals, we say where they're heading to next. So you can see where they're going to. Um, if they get to the players, there's actually a big alert that shows up because at that point we're going to get someone out to like rattle the doors or, or scare the players. Um, if you're wondering where you can get the code from, um, it's actually all online, github.com, uh, pop-up, playground, slash room service. Um, but what I really want to talk about in terms of one of the things that made it possible to develop such a system like this is uh, the system called Platform.io. And I don't know if anyone here has used Platform.io because people show their hands if they have. Oh my goodness, for the rest of you, this is your lucky day. So it's ducking amazing. It is absolutely cool. Because what this lets you do is it lets you do everything from the command line. So if you've worked with the Arduino build environment before and you're used to having lots and lots of tabs and it wants to have this thing which uses the wrong indent size and it's not Vim, so therefore it's not your, your favorite editor, it's very frustrating. This lets me do everything with Vim. It lets me do everything from the command line. So I can run platform.io run dash e teensy32 and it builds a teensy 3.2 image which can then be uploaded. If I want to upload it, I just do it with dash dash target upload and it automatically looks through all of my USB ports, finds the one which is connected to a teensy 3.2 and it goes and uploads it for me, which is super cool. Um, I can also do things like this. <coughs> I want to compile my code to native code to run on my laptop because it's just C++, right? And we can run that on modern computers. So I can do stuff like that. And I'll explain how that works in a second. Um, the way in which I set up all of these targets, the Teensy 3.2 and the native and other things, is it depends upon having a platform.io.ini uh, platform file. And inside that, I have things like this. For my Teensy 3.2, it's a Teensy platform. Um, all the Teensy platforms have sort of similar code which they use. Um, it uses the Arduino framework and the board is a Teensy 3.1. Turns out the 3.1 and 3.2 are the exact same board. One has a better voltage regulator, 3.3 voltage regulator. Um, for local, I just say it's my native platform which compiles down to x86 code. Um, but you might say, hang on a second, Paul. Your laptop doesn't have all that hardware. It doesn't have all the LED drivers on there. It doesn't have the keypad. Uh, it doesn't have general purpose IO pins, all that other stuff. It's not there. How do you compile your game for hardware that's not there? Um, and the answer is you have a slightly different main loop. So the, the regular game has a main loop where we update the game state. And then as a second step, we update the hardware. And it was very, very intentional that these were separate. Nothing inside the game logic touches the hardware, and nothing inside the game hardware touches the game logic. And so what that meant is that instead of having this, where every time we go through the loop, we run a tick of the game, and then we update the, uh, the hardware console, and we check the keyboard to see if the uh, player's typed anything, instead we simply say, run that tick, and then if we're not running on native, do these extra steps here. 
So if I'm running on my native machine, it doesn't bother to try and update all the hardware stuff. And in fact, the files that these come from are completely if and deft out. There is absolutely no code in them. They don't even get try to get compiled, which is fantastic. So obviously, that doesn't give you a playable game, but it gives you a testable game. And um, so when I'm building for native, I simply have a dash D native, which sets that um, uh, uh, define uh, when running my code. Um, I can also have a dash room service um, inside the game data directory. There is a room service file, and it only actually compiles if it sees that, uh, that flag. Um, so this means that we can have a whole bunch of different games inside that game data directory, and only the one that's needed will get compiled. So why is this awesome? Well, first of all, I don't have to use an, an IDE. I can use Vim. And second of all, I can run everything from a make file. Um, so here is how I'm going to uh, run my native code. But then, oh my god, I can run Valgrind. <laughs> now, I am not a serious C or C++ programmer. This is my first time using C++ in many, many years. Valgrind is amazing. <laughs> when you're dealing, yeah, when you're dealing with a chip that has like 64 kilobytes of RAM, and I find it interesting that my first computer had 64 kilobytes of RAM, and I'm now all the way back around again, being able to figure out why is it running out of RAM is amazing. Absolutely amazing. So this was huge, and it runs the game from start to finish with no player input and tells you what sort of leaks you've got. This is incredible. Oops. Um, you can do things like this. Uh, Platform IO device monitor simply says find um, uh, the, the, the microcontroller and start up a serial monitor. So you can see what's coming out from that serial port. It's very, very useful if you're using any sort of serial debugging or in our case where the game runner is getting information. This is my favorite, however. Platform IO test on the local environment. Tests, test cases. What tests? Nobody writes tests. My entire life is spent trying to convince people to write tests for their code. You can write tests for your embedded environments. This is amazing. Um, so Platform.io supports uh, testing uh, both on your native machine and apparently also by uploading test code to your microcontroller and then looking for test results coming back down the serial port, which is amazing. I haven't tried that yet, but certainly the native stuff works great. Um, it uses the Unity test API, and it turns out that everybody wants to call their framework Unity. <laughs> so this is Unity because it lets you do unit tests in C++. It has nothing to do with the game environment, uh, which is written in C Sharp that you might have uh, been used to. Um, but it means that you can have things like a test directory with a pathfinding.cpp file in there, and I can do things like this, where I can say, here is a map, there's a, a visual uh, uh, depiction of what the map looks like, um, and then I can say set up some doors, and then I can say, hey, I want to find a path um, from room one, one to room two, and that's going to be placed into my path object there, and um, print is simply, if it needs to print something out, it's a function that it can call to print things out, and then I can make sure that it just goes to room two, that position zero says I'm going to room two. Um, or I can do more complex things, find a path from one to five, um, and that should go from room two to room three to room five. That should be the shortest path which it goes through. And if I keep on going through this, uh, this file, it then locks the door, which is in between three and five. And we see that it goes, okay, two, three, four, five. It actually goes around that and it path finds correctly. So what lessons have I learned from making this game? Um, well, first of all, FOSS development is awesome. Um, both this project and the project I worked on previously with embedded hardware um, were all done very, very publicly. I was always telling Twitter, um, hey, I'm working on this thing, I'm writing some code, I have no idea what I'm doing because it's C++ and I haven't touched this in ages. Um, and regularly people would come in and they would fix like really large, what I would feel were almost insurmountable problems for me. Um, so my old housemate, Deanna, actually came in and showed me Platform.io with a previous project, because I'm like, oh, I just want to do things from the command line. And she's like, oh, well, I've written a Platform.io.ini file for you. Um, I've added support for these three other microcontrollers. Uh, I've fixed these bugs, and here's this other thing. And um, she normally likes to write software for robots in space, like physical robots in space. And she just sort of went, oh, well, like, it's five minutes work for me to fix Paul's problem. So that was amazing. Um, likewise, I had other people come in for this and actually fix up some of my code as well. 
other things I've learned, pathfinding is hard. Um, I feel that <laughs> I feel that every game developer ever discovers this. Um, so I'm like, oh yeah, I know this. I have a computer science degree, <laughs> and and you're just doing a breadth first search and blah blah blah, and and it kept on blowing out my memory, and um, and it's because you know it couldn't find one way. It would find some ridiculous route around that still wouldn't get there, but it would just it would blow the heap uh, of all of its memory. So that would be bad. Um, so pathfinding is really hard, um, and that leads me on to the next thing which I learned which is debugging memory fragmentation on an embedded device is, is the worst thing you could ever possibly do. And um, because I was writing code like I would for a, a modern computer system, I was like, oh, this thing is here, we'll, we'll allocate this object, blah, 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 the event is fired, we'll clear that object. And what would happen is you'd have a, the, the memory heap would be here, would allocate an object, some other object would be allocated here, this one would get freed, another smaller object will get plopped in that space, and you've now got a little hole here which nothing can use, because it's too small for any data structure. And so, consequently, you'd end up with this fragmentation, and as the game goes on, and invariably it would be around like 26 minutes into a 30 minutes game, um, the whole thing would die because it would run out of memory. Now, luckily, we solved that before launch, but it was still this very, very frustrating thing. Um, and I had to find a whole bunch of code which let me measure where fragmentation was happening, and if I've got time during questions and answers, I'll show you that. Um, but if you're wondering how terrible it is, here is, has anyone here used lol commits? So, yeah, lol commits takes pictures of you when you commit code. This is... <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture of me after I'd come home from a day of, of debugging that memory fragmentation. So... <laughs> So as you can see, it, lol commits is also the best thing ever because it gives you the commit hash and like <laughs> all these other things. So I've managed to actually like debug that problem now um, and I was always scheduling extra events so we didn't free that movement object. But you can just see how filled with joy I am there <laughs> working at my, at my computer. Um, so how, how did all this run? Um, sorry, what's the current state of the project? Um, well, the current state of the project is that you can make bookings at elsewhererooms.com. Um, there's actually a number of, of rooms uh, by Pop-Up Playground, which is the group that I've been working with, and you can make all the bookings there. The gotcha is that we've been having venue issues. So we spent a lot of time uh, setting up this, uh, this venue and um, uh, producing this game, and uh, then the venue's like, oh, actually, we know that we said that we're going to have everyone here and it'll be great, but actually, we just want to close down the venue that we're operating in, or, or something like that. I know that there were lawyers involved and it was complicated. Um, so right now, we are between venues. But if you want to keep up to date, popupplayground.com.au is where you can um, uh, do that. Um, there is also, as I mentioned before, uh, a GitHub repository. I'm hoping in a few months' time we'll actually get the game back up and running, and we've got a whole bunch of extra uh, improvements we want to make as well. And in fact, if you go there, there are lots and lots of issues. You can see um, uh, very much how the game was built over time by following the issue tracker, um, and there's also some improvements we'd like to make there as well. Um, so with that, I will say thank you. Follow us on Twitter. You now applaud. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And, and if, you want, if you want a copy of this talk, you can actually find it on github.com slash pjf slash talks, where slowly all of my talks are migrating to. Um, they all use their own custom build framework, which can be another talk which I can give later on, um, but they're all slowly going up online. So hopefully we have time for uh, questions. Yeah, if, if Cheese would like to set up now, we can probably have time for a couple of quick questions. Yeah. Anyone got a question? Or just <laughs> well, I've got a question then. Why don't you yes. move it to Hobart? I, I would love that, but there's a <laughs> team of like six people involved, so... <laughs> Why don't you move them to Hobart? Oh, that would also be fabulous. Oh yeah, do we have any questions for Paul though? It's oh yes, there's one there. Yes. Please summarise how you fixed your defragging problems. Yes. Oh, oh, okay, that's a great question. So how did I... How did I diagnose and solve the... So, first of all, what I thought was memory fragmentation was actually the Pathfinder blowing out my memory by itself. So that was diagnosis number one. 
Um, a second diagnosis for the memory defrag problems is if I had my laptop still plugged in, um, I actually found a little snippet of code which is architecture dependent, which shows you the distance between the stack and the heap. And that essentially gives you an indication of how much free memory do you have left. And then um, uh, every second, I think it was, or every whatever tick I had defined it as, I would print out, here is the memory usage, and also before and after major events, I would also print out memory usage as well. And at that point, I could say, oh, hang on a second, I've run the Pathfinder. The Pathfinder has, like, it should end with the same amount of memory as it started with, and it didn't. So I know there's going to be uh, memory leakage there. The other things which I did, moving lots of things from dynamically, memorated, dynamically allocated memory to uh, stack allocated memory. So lots and lots of things would be defined in the function or defined on the object and in the class. Um, and also try to reuse things as much as possible. So the, the cannibals which moved around would always have a movement event and would used to clear that when they finished moving. Instead, what we'd do is we'd simply take it off the event queue, but they could hang on to it in their object so we could reuse it later on. And that meant we, we didn't deallocate something and reallocate it later on, because that was a, a chance for fragmentation to happen. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Wonderful. One oh, question. yes. Uh, I was just curious. How long did it take you to uh, A, come up with the idea and B, put mm -hmm. it into motion? That is an awesome question. So coming up with the idea was um, thankfully not my job. Um, so I was the game developer. I wasn't necessarily the game designer, although I ended up being the mechanics designer for a lot of it because it's like, I know that this is easy to program, this is hard to program. Um, I think overall... I would need to check, but I think it was about 80 hours worth of work overall for, for all the coding and everything, um, and some of the hardware. But of course, we all, Ricky was amazing in terms of she did most of the hardware build and everything. Um, and of course, I certainly didn't do any of the special effects or the sound recordings or the sound desk or the lighting desk or any of that. So my particular chunk was, I want to say about 80 hours. I would have to go and check to be sure. Um, but for everyone else, a lot more than that probably. Certainly a lot more than that combined. Any other questions? Uh, I think we're probably out of oh. time. Um, so I can keep doing questions until this works. Uh, well, <laughs> I do have some other statements to make. OK, cool. Um, so first one is, uh, I've just been told that to get more people to sign up for Lightning Talks, I have three copies of the KSP book that <gasps> Paul recently finished. Oh well, yeah, and me, but yeah. you can whatever, I? yeah. Um, that uh, we'll give out as prizes if you want to go into the Lightning Talks. It's a pretty good book, I've been told. Uh, but you will have to collect it tomorrow because I don't physically have them with me.